This is Segway, a weekly program exploring the lives and work of the people of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Segway the show that allows us to talk about issues and ideas here on the campus of Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. I'm Kevin Leonard, the Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, and I'm very pleased to be here today with Dr. Scott Selnow Richmond, Assistant Professor in the Department of Applied Communication Studies. Dr. Selnow Richmond earned his bachelor's degree in 2009 and his master's degree in 2011, both in communications from Western Michigan University, and he completed his PhD in communication in 2015 at Wayne State University. He joined the faculty at SIUE in the summer of 2019. His primary research focuses on communication surrounding identity in organizational and interpersonal contexts. Specifically, he has studied LGBT plus identity, body weight and body image, transnational identities, and work and paternity leave. Welcome to Segway, Dr. Selnow Richmond. Thank you very much, sir. Happy to be here. Well, let's begin by having you tell our audience a little bit about yourself. How did you become interested in communications? Sure. So it was kind of a circuitous route. Uh, I actually started as being interested in broadcast communications. And back home in Battle Creek, Michigan, at Kellogg Community College, uh, there was a program at the time, since defunct, which was a sort of catch-all media training program, a two-year program, as tends to be the case for community college, And part of that was, of course, television and radio training, but also part of the curriculum was interpersonal communication and communication theory. And so that led to a somewhat inauspicious career as a broadcaster for a while back home. And when I decided to transition back into finishing a four-year degree at Western Michigan University, it was a pretty easy transition as I frankly had the most credits for a communication degree. And I remembered enjoying writing. I I always enjoyed the interpersonal communication and organizational communication content that I was exposed to. And so it sort of fell, I sort of fell into an enjoyment of the theory and the mechanics and the sort of, no pun intended, the humanity of studying a humanities degree in that way Mm -hmm. and sort of the pragmatism behind it and the things you could actually do with it. And so it was a serendipitous, but a very good uh, path I had. Now, um, you mentioned that you decided at some point that you you needed the, uh, or you wanted the four-year degree. So so tell us a little more about that that decision. What was it that led you to go back to to college to finish the four-year degree? I think part of it was self-actualization. Like a lot of people, I wanted to prove to myself that I could do it. And part of it was through a combination of being in a relatively small town and frankly, not being a particularly gifted broadcaster. I felt that, okay, you know, this is fun and I really enjoyed doing it. But I reached a point, as I think a lot of people do in their mid-20s, of, okay, now what? how can I actualize more? How can I better situate myself for more success? And what things do I still want to do? And so it was a pretty um, clear idea for me that the way to go would be to continue to pursue my education. And I actually already had a sort of a unique background in that I am a high school dropout. I never finished my high school degree. Um, I dropped out in junior high, which anyone listening, I do not recommend. But (laughs) I was lucky in that I sort of fell into community college, which did not require a high school transcript for admission. And I did two years and had enough credits that a four-year university didn't want to look at my high school transcript because what mattered was how I did in college because I'd done two years of college. And so I sort of just oopsed my way into higher ed and have a pretty unique story with that. I actually, if anyone comes to my office, I have, of course, my my degree is framed, and I also have my letter of expulsion from Battle Creek Central High School, removing me from the roster framed next to my degrees. <laughs> oh, wow. I, I have to say, I, that's a very unusual uh, yes. trajectory there. So, um, Now, were there important individuals who encouraged and supported you as, as you pursued this academic path? Yeah, one of the things that I learned long before I became an educator myself was the impact you can have on an individual student by recognizing potential in them. Students 
love and should be praised for the things that they are doing. What I think can be even more transformative is an educator or anyone of some importance in their life saying to them, like, you can't, you're not doing this yet, but I can see you doing it. I can visualize something in you that maybe you don't see yourself. And I had someone by the name of uh, Mr. Gene Andrews, who has since retired, but was the head of the Broadcasting and Communications Department, uh, BROCO, as they called it, at Kellogg Community College, who very early on took me as someone who, I don't mind saying, didn't have direction, didn't have really much of anything, shall we say, other than I knew I wasn't happy being a high school dropout. Um and sort of trying to support myself the best way I could. And he, other than, you know, full credit, of course, to my mother and people of importance like that, but somebody from outside my family who's the first one at when I was technically an adult to sit me down and say, you have a lot of talent. He's like, you're not using it and you don't recognize it and you don't, you don't see it in yourself. And he said, and you need to move past that because you can do a lot of things. And he stewarded me through a couple really difficult years of my life. And that, more than anything, was the core of why I wanted to get into what we do, which is Mm -hmm. I can't, certainly can't guarantee I would ever have that kind of profound impact on anybody. But if I could have one-tenth of that impact on several people, so much the better, let alone having that kind of relationship or that kind of guidance for someone who needs to be seen as something that can be actualized but they don't see yet. Well, that's a a really powerful story. Thank you for sharing that with us. and I, I certainly I find inspiration in the idea that that someone might be as as uh, you know any faculty member might be as as uh, able to 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 influence a, a person's development as as your professor was. Um, now, how have your personal experiences? You've mentioned, for example, that you you didn't finish high school, uh, but how have your personal experiences influenced your career? Sure. So. In a lot of ways, I had some really great teachers and I had some really bad teachers. You know, most people don't drop out of high school because they have great mentorship and great mm-hmm. support. And I, I can't put on the onus of responsibility on other people for my choices, but but I learned very early on what can make for effective mentorship and what cannot. Mm-hmm. And so that was a big factor in that I didn't particularly appreciate my school experience, but I loved learning. And I loved self-actualization and I I loved a lot of things about it. And so that was part of it. Uh, I learned from broadcasting. I learned from performance. I learned how to bring performativity in a good way to the classroom. Uh, I teach a lot of public speaking right now. I'm co-teaching the large lecture public speaking class here in Dunham Hall in the theater. And one thing I've learned is that teaching can be and oftentimes benefits from being showmanship of, you know, be bigger than you are, whether you're on a stage or in a classroom with, you know, 10 graduate students, you can still, uh, you, I, my grandma would say you, you have to have the steak, but you need to have a little sizzle too every now and again. And I, I learned that. And so that, and just the value of being accepted, I always tell students, it's kind of hokey. It's kind of a dad joke, but this university has accepted all of you. We as a university need you to accept us. And make SIUE a part of your identity. You know, hold us accountable when when things aren't as you feel they should be, but embrace this university the way we are trying to embrace you. Those were all things I learned from lived experience, and I can speak to with hopefully with some authenticity. Oh wow! Let's let's talk a little bit about your research. How have how have your experiences affected your scholarly research? Sure. So from the beginning of my master's program at Western Michigan, I wanted to study weight because I. Like a lot of people, my weight has fluctuated significantly throughout my life. I was medically overweight for a long period of my life, including in high school, which led to some you know, awkward social situations and dynamics that weren't very healthy. And I've gone about how I manage that in healthy and unhealthy ways. And so I really, that was a driving force. And I knew from personal experience, and this was the core of my master's thesis, was people treat you and speak to you very differently post-weight loss. And you or I and and my research participants really felt like, okay, but I am the same person. I have the same value. I like the same things. I Maybe I change some behaviors, but most of my behaviors, I live in the same place. I drive the same car. I have the same hair. But now you like me. And that feels good, but that also feels pretty bad. Mm-hmm. You know, because wh- who was I before? You know, and what if, I ch- what if I change again? Am I no longer this good person? Am I? And so that 
really drove me and stigma and being separated socially has been a part of my life significantly. Mm. And so I always said um, people can be really cruel and my goal is to figure out why on earth anyone would ever do that. And that's sort of the thesis of my research. Oh, wow. So you mentioned the topic of, of your research and you, you implied that, well, and you indicated that, that, the, uh, that you've talked to people um, who, who share certain experiences. Can you, can you tell us a little bit more about the, the process of research and, and perhaps how it's evolved over the course of your, your career? Yeah, so I've always fancied myself a qualitative research. I, I love stats. I think stats are very useful. Uh, I'm, I'm, my brain is more wired to interviewing as laborious as that can be just in terms of time because I think anything worth doing is worth doing well, especially asking people to speak to you about their personal experiences, particularly as so happens with me, including in workplace contexts, which is what I focus more on now. Uh, you're asking people to talk about things that aren't very positive and don't necessarily make them feel really good to relive. And so it takes a lot of time to do it, and it takes even more time to do it well. Uh, and so I've had to factor that factor that in in terms of, you know, I, I would never want to produce research that isn't good, but I'd also never want to not finish projects. And, you know, and I'm untenured and there are expectations that I um, appreciate and embrace. And so I have to be like anybody tenured or not. Right. You have to be strategic about mm-hmm. your projects and find the time. And so I do have found a lot of enjoyment and benefit in working with research teams Um my preferred research partner is my wife who lives with me. So that facilitates a lot of good collaboration. She's also smarter than me. So that helps too, uh, significantly so. And so I have found embracing teams and I have setting goals, realistic time goals, and I have small children. So for me to, I'm not a, and doc school, you know, unmarried, no kids can just burn through the night just gr- and loving it. I, like that's not healthy for me anymore, even if it was then. So just being realistic and being kind to myself while still holding myself to the high standard that I think this university deserves has been a balance. Okay. Well, what, what, what conclusions have you drawn from those interviews that you've conducted from your research? What, what have we learned about the ways in which people communicate? Uh, people do so carelessly, <laughs> frankly. Uh, Sometimes maliciously, oftentimes not. Um, I think that by and large people, and you see this so much with the current incoming uh, post-high school generation of college students, people just want some fluidity to themselves. Just take the time to recognize me as an individual person. Uh, There's less focus on group membership. There's more focus on let me make my own choices. You know, I've done research on paternity leave, as you said, and, and men, cisgendered men in particular, um, just based upon the people who took place in my study. That wasn't a design. But taking time off for their post-birth of their first child with the person they were partnered with. And the thing that came up again and again is just let me make my own decision. You know, mm-hmm. I wish I could just make this decision in a vacuum because what kept coming up is they would say, I would say, you know, what was your approach to paternity leave? And they said, I would have taken a year if they had given me a year. And I would say, oh, how much did they offer you? And they said, oh, four weeks. I go, okay, so how much did you take? And they'd say, two weeks. <laughs> and I would say, okay, so why is that? And they said, I just, I don't know. There was this, this you can't see me doing air quotes, sorry, folks, but this vibe <laughs> or sometimes explicit messages of, you know, Joe, he took all four weeks and eh, you can do that, but, but, but it was never explicit, right? And so the theme that keeps coming up is socially and organizationally, we have a way of, You don't tell people the rules, but you kind of hint around them Mm -hmm. or even not even that, but still punish them for breaking rules that maybe they didn't know existed or certainly don't exist in organizational policy on paper, so to say. Oh, that's really fascinating. Yeah. And and to hear you speak about that example is is really, I mean, it's very thought provoking to me in terms of of the ways in which uh, people, I think, are conditioned to to obey rules that, that are more unwritten than they are written. Yeah, that, that's really, oh, wow. Um, it sounds as if your, your research might have a lot of connections into other disciplines as well. Is it influenced by uh, or does it relate to research in psychology or sociology? Oh, absolutely. I think the communication discipline is really a child of sociology. 
and psychology, you know, the Chicago School and whatnot, and you, names like Irving Goffman and G, George Herbert Mead and these folks whose work have formed Judith Butler, who formed sort of the core of what I research are not necessarily calm scholars. You know, com- communication is sort of a teenager of a discipline, you know, with the behavioral problems that come with it. Um, that's a that's a joke, folks. Sorry. But I... Uh, <laughs> They, people are going to listen to this. Um, And so what's funny to me is that can be a point of pride or that can be a sort of a sore spot, depending upon who you talk to. I sort of embrace it as in, I mean, to me, everything is communication. Psych is communication. Mm -hmm. Theater is communication. Mathematics is communication. You know, physics, it's all of it. Uh, Because calm to me is everything just put through the prism of human experience. And, and human reconciliation because humans need to experience nature somehow because mm-hmm. you know the the human human beings are so unique in that we are the only and I'm getting a little philosophical here we are the only things creatures we know of on earth that can take nature and through the our understanding create some version of it that's not real which is art mm-hmm. right because art is representing nature in a way that nature cannot create it you know I, I could paint you an orange and make it purple and you still know what it is and only human beings can do that. And that's communication to me. Communication mm-hmm. is just taking things that are more concrete and expressing them in a way only a human being could, for better or worse. Yeah. Right. And for whatever reason, my research tends to be more on the darker side, but that exists. So, mm. Wow. Well, thank you. Um, what's next on your research agenda? Great question. I've been working with grads. I have had the blessing of working with graduate students for the first time in my career since coming to SIUE, which is the best. And I am right now working on a couple of things in terms of like teaching exercises and things like that, trying to get the grad students in a conference and experiencing that in a way that's maybe more, I don't want to say pragmatic, but more functional than those things. I also have um, some ideas. I have a theory critique that's out right now where I took the theory I actually used years ago for my dissertation and I've been sort of sitting with it in terms of trying to push that evolve that theory a bit forward and update it to be more mm. more inclusive as things need to be right now um I had a piece not too long ago that came out that was on sort of LGBT bullying within the LGBT community and sort of policing each other's be of like do transgender individuals fit within this community or do they not do bisexual individuals fit within this community? Like it's in the acronym, but that mm-hmm. doesn't mean that the community is one big happy family, just like any community. Right. And so one thing that came up in my research that was a limitation that I, I absolutely own up to is it wasn't taking into account, like what does it mean to be African-American and transgender and in that community where you've got layers upon layers of conflicting identities Right. And so removing race from that piece was more of just trying to get my arms around it, but was also sort of a failure, I think, that I need to address and trying Mm -hmm. to look at that. So lots of stuff, lots of fun stuff for me. (laughs) Fun for me. It sounds like you you will certainly be kept busy by your research. Now, how does your, your research influence your teaching or how is it related to what you do in the classroom? I think the most important thing is being able to, and I don't mean any disrespect because I didn't understand what the role of a researcher was for professors when I was in college. Mm-hmm. And so for me to be able to illustrate when I'm in a lecture talking about weight or I'm talking about identity or go, and I can point to my own work, of course that gives credibility to me as an instructor, but also illustrates to students like here's how these cogs all fit together in a way. Cause I have many students I talk to and I talk about research and they go like, so wait, what, what do you do? Because they get the teaching and the service part, and some, mm-hmm. and to be clear, some students absolutely understand the role of research in a university, but a lot of them don't. Like myself, I didn't, and so it allows me, I think, a really fun way to illustrate what does communication look like as a discipline. How can it actually? Because again, I think the current gener- Gen Z, whatever you want to call them, they they don't like their time wasted. They like to see things that work, things that do things, things that help, things that move discourses forward. And I get to point to it and go, see, this can do something real. You know, students often say, like, we, we, we like things that are fun and we like things that create positivity mm-hmm. in the world. And so that's kind of been my mantra. And so I'm able to say, look, I'm able to illustrate things that maybe can get people talking, get people behaving more equitably. Uh, that tends to help students understand why it's important to do. Okay. Um 
and and you you uh, you started teaching here at SIUE in uh, 2019, and then uh, I believe you you moved from a non tenure track into a tenure track position in the fall of 20. Correct. And and in the midst of that, there was this <laughs> pandemic that uh, affected how everybody does everything here. So yeah. how did that affect your 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 teaching? Your, even your scholarship, how did, it, how did that affect your life here at the university? It was really strange timing. It was really strange timing. And in the wake of how the pandemic affected other people, of course, it was not particularly important, right, to be clear. But it was surreal because I interviewed in a suit and tie in my basement, you know, with my department <laughs> and the search committee of people that I'd worked with for a year yeah. and uh, gave my research presentation over Zoom. Uh, it impacted my teaching that I was lucky enough to be asked to teach the FST course during lockdown, during like our fall uh-huh. of like the most stringent restrictions. So I taught a Zoom class of students that were joining the university, um, oftentimes not really physically or right. geographically. And I took that, I take, I take every class seriously, but I took incredibly seriously of like, look, I've got to really give them grace and give them like stability. Uh, I don't want to infantilize any students because they're adults, but it's it's akin to when things are going wrong. You never tell your kids that you're nervous, right? <laughs> you got to be the you got to be the hero, and that was kind of how I felt. But again, these were adults, and they, they didn't need that in a childlike way. But I just wanted to show them, like, look, this is, you not even don't be scared, but you belong here. Right. This university cares about you. I care about you. And I'm going to give you the most I can while being honest with you about our limitations. And that was one of the most interesting and impactful experiences I had. And that was just during all of this, during that transition, right. during the pandemic and like the, all of it. And so uh, I felt very lucky to transition to SIU at all, sure. including as NTT, because NTT faculty are so important to every university, including ours. But to be able to transition into a tenure track role was a big blessing in my life. But I don't even want to say bittersweet because it was just it was just a wonderful transition. But it it definitely had that feeling of this is not how I imagined this change happening. Right. <laughs> of course. Can I can I ask you a follow up question about the uh, the students in those uh, first semester transition uh, sections that you taught? Did were have you been able to reconnect with some of those students or remain connected with them since that that difficult fall semester of twenty twenty? You know I haven't, and that maybe I didn't put enough effort into that. I definitely left the door open, but I tend to my default is I'm a pretty uh, reserved person socially. Period, mm-hmm. and you know try to keep clear boundaries in my job and all those things and so i did not and i should have I, i'm realizing it now as we record this um if any of them hear this please feel free to touch base but it was it was a difficult emotional situation for everyone and so nothing would make me happier than for any of them to come to my office hours or just whatever but the funny thing is like i don't know if they would recognize me you know, mm-hmm. because it's so different seeing somebody on it. And like it, this was a couple of years ago now. Right. right. And we all look physically different. But if any of you remember Dr. Scott, yeah, you are always welcome <laughs> to come talk to me. <laughs> well, I, I certainly didn't want to make you feel self-conscious about that. It's, I just you know what you what you said, I think, was so important in terms of of how critical that time was for a, really an entering class of students whose experience was was not like anything any of us had ever experienced before. And and certainly one of the things that I think is is most remarkable, and we, you know, we know that that some of those students decided not to stay here, but, right. and I don't know that any of the students in your sections of FST didn't stay, but but we know what the what the retention rate looks like for that cohort. Yeah. But the the amazing thing to me is that there there was enough cohesiveness and community that was able to be constructed so that so that a, a substantial number of those students decided to stay and now I hope that they are making that transition back to where we're mostly a face-to-face campus mm-hmm. and most of most of our classes involve that that interaction with people uh, in person which I, th- I think is a it's it's so valuable in what we do at the, the university so um, now 
uh, moving on to a, a different topic that you've touched on a little bit, but I'd, I'd love to hear more about how your teaching and research support uh, SIUE's anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. Sure. So just by the nature of looking at social stigmatization and social separation and and the gendered nature of work, you know, you kind of can't avoid looking at diverse voices and social inequity in communication and thus the resources that that communication or lack thereof can can allot. And so one of the ways that I've been moving forward more and more is trying to account for race more and more in what I do because and I'm not trying to diminish anyone's work uh, except my own. But one of the things, especially when you study gender, is as a researcher, you can almost subconsciously give yourself a pass on everything else. It's like, well, I'm mm-hmm. looking I'm looking at an important topic, which it is. And by the nature of you have to get your arms around a study somehow, right? And so certain things have to fall by the wayside. But And there's a difference between going into the limitations and going, Okay, limitation was I didn't account for race and then never coming back to it and a limitation and then following up that piece with something else. And that's sort of the stage I'm moving into. Uh, But as I said, I have been looking at like LGBT uh, community identity and pre-pandemic, I was able to do a presentation actually of in a sociology course on that because it just happened to be an intersection of interest uh, for that faculty member, which was wonderful. And so it's, it's important to me. It's a natural extension of what I do, but... Again, it also, I think, lends credibility to students of like, look, I don't just talk about this. Right. I, I thread this and, and make it a foundational aspect of what I do. Because, and you know this better than I do, students are always looking for, a, as an institution, okay, do you say this or do you do it? Mm-hmm. Do you put the safe space sticker on your office door and that's it? Or are you living it? And those stickers are very important, don't get me wrong. But students give me that feedback all the time of, we're kind of checking for, okay, is the safe space your office? Or are you trying to make campus the safe space? Because mm-hmm. that's what we want. Absolutely. And so research, as you know, is one part of that of, look, look, I thread this in everything I do, not just the way I talk to you in class, but also the way I contribute to my discipline through the umbrella of this university's identity, not just mm-hmm. my own. And I'm out there in Chicago, in St. Louis, in Houston at a conference going, like, look, this university is prioritizing equity in what I do. That's really important. And I, it's really important to me to do that. Well, thank you. Um, I always like to end, end interviews by asking for, for you to offer our listeners some advice. So what, what advice would you offer to a student who's interested in studying communication? Um, come talk to me or anyone. <laughs> if you just walk into anybody's office and say, I'm interested in studying communication, like you will get a very warm reception, especially from me. But also um, take a look at calm is more than public speaking. If you love public speaking, terrific. But if you are interested in gender and sexuality, in race, in public relations, in organizations, you know, or... Of course, we're a great major, but we're also a very complementary minor with all kinds of things, with business, with nursing, with you know sociology, psychology, the related disciplines. Broader, though, in terms of the university experience, I always tell students, dabble in everything. Dabble in broadcasting, in, in athletics to the degree you're interested. Join groups, make your own group, go to the muck, go look at the art installations, walk the campus. This is the one time in your life where pretty much everyone says you're allowed to just kind of do whatever and Mm -hmm. figure yourself out. No matter how old you are, you know, whether you're a brand new freshman or you're coming back to college after 10, 15, 20 years, this is the thing where you're allowed to figure yourself out and spread out. And to waste that opportunity, I think, is really tragic. Try out for things tried acting, try broadcasting, try whatever, and just squeeze as much out of this experience as you can, especially now that you can, again, especially if you're a freshman that didn't get to do it and maybe you're on the fence about it, you're not going to like the university less the more involved you get, in my opinion. Yeah, well, that sounds like great advice, and I'm so so pleased to hear you talk about uh, the range of, of um, expertise within the Department of Applied Communication Studies, 
uh, and I heartily endorse uh, your suggestion that people should should think about uh, minors as well as majors. And and particularly, I don't know that a lot of students coming in have really thought about the academic fields of interpersonal communication or organizational communication uh, or public relations even. So so thank you for, for sharing that with us. So uh, I just want to thank you again, Dr. Scott Selnow richmond for talking with us about your experiences, your research, and your teaching. I look forward to further conversations with you about your research and your teaching. And for our listeners, thank you for joining us. Stay safe and take care. This has been Segway, a production of the Department of Mass Communications at Southern Illinois University Edwardsville. All rights reserved.